You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. All right, welcome along to my show, Straight to Video. And as always, I'm your host, Rob Lane, and I really appreciate you listening. Today, I have the pleasure of catching up with a guy who I got to tour with back in 2008 on one of their early tours before the world went crazy for them and they headed out with some of the biggest names in rock on the planet. Mickey Satya was the lead singer of the band Dear Superstar. And back when I was filling in on bass with my friend's drug dealer cheerleader, we did a bunch of UK shows with Dear Superstar, who I can only describe as rock and roll hooligans. Incredibly friendly hooligans, but out of control all the same. Yet following these shows, Mickey and the band saw things go through the roof as record deals were signed and they edited out on tour with Papa Roach, Buck Cherry and appeared at the Download Festival in Donington. Now just as things seemed to be going great, the band took their foot off the gas and it wasn't until a few years later that they would once again return. During that downtime, though, Mickey began putting together pieces for a brand new career, one that would see him embrace his love of TV and cinema. He began acting and also became a filmmaker himself and has since started the film company King's Habit Films. And some of you may have even seen him on your TV screens in Coronation Street as Raul Pazwan, a role that he will hopefully be reprising in the near future. Quite a departure from the stages all over the UK in a rock and roll band. I think you'll hear we had a lot of fun during this chat. We talk all about Mickey's childhood and his introductions to music, his love of film, touring with Dear Superstar and also getting the role in Coronation Street. It's perhaps one of the most varied and unpredictable journeys we've had on this show, but it's a blast to hear all about it. Before our talk, as always, we have Dead School Coffee supporting this podcast and they're giving you, the listener, 15% off any order of their ground and full bean coffee through their website, deadschoolcoffee.co.uk. Simply head on over, fill your shopping basket and add the discount code STV on checkout. Those guys roll and I'm proud to have them support this podcast. All right, let's do this. You can find Mickey on Instagram and also through his film company, kingshabitfilms.com, where all their videos and short films are available to watch. But right now, let's dive into my straight-to-video chat with singer, actor, and filmmaker, Mickey Satya. Hey. How's it going? Yes, success. <laughs> How's it going, man? I'm all right, mate. Lovely to see your face. Been a while. Yeah, and you. I know. Fucking hell. I was thinking about it on the way home when I was driving because I was stuck in like endless amounts of traffic thinking, oh, I'm just not going to bother preparing anything. I'm just going to try and remember all the grotesque things that we used to get up to when we are in the band days, but uh, <laughs> some probably best not best for podcasts, so... <laughs> Save that for the book later on down the Yeah, line. exactly. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, you need to come up with like a Motley Crue style name, The Dirt. What would the Dear Superstar name be, do you reckon? It's similar. I think it would be called The Shit. <laughs> <laughs> the Turd. The Turd, yeah. The Unknown Turd, yeah. Amazing. So how are you keeping? Everything good? Yeah, good, mate. Yeah, not bad at all. Sweet, man. What's going off in the background? It looks like some quality movie tips of the hat. Oh, mate. Yeah, so when I set up this production company, we do like short films and do little sketches and um, realised that the first realisation was when I got my first screening in an actual cinema. I was like, oh, my God, it looks fucking terrible. <laughs> so when I moved into this new house, I designated one room as like the screening room. It sounds way better than it actually is. So it's like big projector and then just all cinema stuff on the walls, all quality 80s movies like done by this artist who makes them all look dead vintage so what you got you got Ghostbusters is that a Goonies one yeah Goonies Ghostbusters Gladiator Pulp Fiction Brewster's Millions classic oh nice See that? yeah 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 it's the old um, Cubs jersey that he uh he turns up in. There can't be much Brewster's Millions merchandise or memorabilia out there. That's a good find, that is. Fucking shame, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to do to you what my daddy did to me. I'm going to make you hate, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so good. 
Sweet, man. Well, thank you for doing this. I was trying to think when those gigs were. I think it was 2008. Yeah, it was something like that. It was before, like, the whole circus really kicked off. Yeah. But, yeah, man, they were, like, those were the days that, even though we did loads of cool shit after that, those are the ones that always stand out. It's weird, isn't it, that kind of thing? You end up doing some, like, cool stuff, but it almost becomes too regimented, all that kind of thing. It's all the early stuff is where you're flying by the seats to your pants. Mate, zero pennies in the bank, fan breaking down every five minutes, borrowing instruments, breaking amplifiers, like, losing our jobs I remember Smed we were like mate we're going on tour and we ain't got any money like you're going to have to sell your car he's like I've just bought it and it was his pride and joy it was a bright yellow Mercedes SLK I was like nah, I'm tough shit mate it's got to go it's like you don't need that when we're going to be rock stars it'll look ridiculous in a yellow SLK so fucking sell it so he got an absolute pittance for it and then we used the money and went out on tour mate you guys must have been all in then I mean everybody says they're all in oh we're going to take over the world but get someone in a corner and say sell your car <laughs> Mate, we were so far, we were so deeply in, we, we were like, it was complete blind ambition. We had no doubt in our minds that this is what we were going to do in our lives. And we begged, stole and borrowed everything, every last thing. I mean, Smith lost his house. Fucking serious shit. He lost his house because of it. You know, I didn't see my daughter for a long, long period of time because I was recording or touring. I was away and we just, nothing mattered. We lived in a bubble where our first album that we professionally got released was called Heartless. And in the sleeve, it says devoid of emotion over one's own greatness because we were completely devoid of emotion of any responsibility or any damage we were causing to other people or ourselves because we just wanted to be great. How long had you all known each other before the band got together? Me and Adam have known each other all our lives. Yeah. Smev, we went to primary school together. We grew up on the same street. So all our lives, Benj... I've met him. Well, I met his mother first. <laughs> Classic story. <laughs> Is that going where I think it's going? <laughs> no, it's not actually. Like when we first started out in our old band, I mean, fucking hell, we must have been about 15. And this guy came up to us and said, oh, um, I'm going to manage your band. And I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah, no one else is going to manage us. We'll take that. And then our drummer left and he was like, oh, someone who I go to church with, her son's a drummer. And I'm like, all right, sound. So Benj, you know, Benj, like scraggly hair, tattoos everywhere, 7,000 feet tall, rocks up 12 years old. I was like, hiya. I'm like, who the fuck's this? And his mum gave me a full born dressing down. It's like, you better look after him. No drugs, no bloody girls, no, no alcohol. And I had to look after a child. And he became our long time, never left drummer. Tattooist and everything. Yeah, exactly. Like, he's a monster of a man now. He grew up only knowing Dear Superstar. He was a kid when he joined. And then Stu was like, went his mate we went to college with. And then we're like final tap of bass players. So. Oh, amazing, man. Amazing. How are you for time, Mickey? Absolutely fine. Well, remember in, back in the day, we used to do our last song. We had to drink a bottle of um, vodka before the song was finished. Well, I've got a bottle of red wine. I'm going to finish that before this is finished. So. I'm going to throw things back a little bit before Dear Superstar. I believe you were born in, is it Rossendale or Rosendale, Lancashire? Yeah, Rosendale. Center of the fucking universe. Grew up in the 80s, becoming a teenager in the 90s. Is that kind of still your home base? Are you near there now? Yeah, near enough. Yeah, I mean, I've flitted around a little bit, but um, I live about 10 miles away from my hometown. My parents only recently moved away. My sisters still live there. Somewhere to come back to and reset away from all the madness. Yeah, massively. I mean, it's so weird, Rosendale. So we've got a train that only runs on a weekend on a Saturday and a Sunday. And it's a steam train. And it goes five miles up the road to where I live now, a place called Ramsbottom. And like Ramsbottom is classic. It's like everyone in this town is so obsessed with like the name Ramsbottom. You've got like the Ram's head. You've got half of the Ram. You've got a little pub called The Ram. And then there's a brothel called The Ramsbottom. It's a joke. I made a joke. I've seen your little stand-up skit, mate. <laughs> yeah, so like Rosendale really is like the centre of the universe. It's home. And no matter where I go, no matter how long away I am for, everyone's got the same thing. I mean, they're, they're a little town. But everyone, they're, they're nice. It doesn't matter what you've done. Everyone's kind of like dead down to earth. They'll, they'll bring you down to earth if you aren't. So yeah, I love it. I will always be here. So it's got my heart this place. I remember growing up, I never saw a skyscraper until I was in my teens. People around here, they call it that Manchester. Have you been to that Manchester? <laughs> Fucking hell. It's like 10 miles up the road. Was the city of Manchester a big draw to you growing up? Was it, oh God, was it like London to some people? And Yeah, dude. Like, so I grew up absolutely saying in the 80s and 90s, idolising Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses and Black Sabbath and all these kind of bands that we both absolutely adore and love. What happened to Stone Roses and Oasis? Well, that's it. So, like, you're obliged to live in, in the outskirts of Manchester to love Oasis and the Stone Roses and Ian Brown and all these, like, Manchester bands. You just, by default, start loving them. So Manchester, to me, was like, that's the epicentre of music or the closest to an epicentre of music I can get to. I can't get to Los Angeles. I'm fucking 12 years old. I want to get to Manchester. Yeah, but I mean, if you're, I guess, around like early 90s, you'd have been at that age where Stone Roses exploded 
when would it be? 89, 90 time. Then you had Oasis coming in straight after that, all centred around where you are. There must have been a huge vibe about that. Yeah, so when Definitely Maybe came out, it was 94. What age was I? 13 at that point. No, that's a lie. 15, 94? No, 13, yeah. So I was 13 years old, so I was becoming an adult. I was finding bands for the first time that my sisters or my dad or whatever hadn't passed down to me. And it was Oasis. And Manchester was that Manchester. But it was that Manchester that was only like a 40-minute bus ride away. Cost 50p to get there. Me and Smed used to go there as kids and we'd go to like Vinyl Exchange and all these different like record stores just plowing through the records. I like, fucking hell, this is like, this is where I want to be. And it's just fucking Manchester. Like looking back now, people are so globalized, aren't they? Which is a great thing in many ways. But I don't think now we have the appreciation of um, like the bright lights of a city when you grow up in a small place. Do you know what I mean? And I think we neglect our children that journey a little bit. You know, we didn't have social media. We didn't see things that... We just saw the glory of Los Angeles and going down the Sunset Strip and doing cocaine and fucking prostitutes. You know, that's it was just such a far cry away from reality. When reality became the end of the motorway, you're like, actually, I can have a piece of this. It's like a special time. Whereas now you feel like you're in LA all the time. You feel like you're in America. You feel like you're part of the Kardashian world by just turning on your TV. So, yeah, I do feel like um, like the kids, the kids are today. <laughs> Feel like good today. I had a real book bringing. <laughs> <laughs> so your youngest of three kids, right? Yeah, so I've got two older sisters. Oh, was that two older sisters? <laughs> yeah, man. But they were quite a bit older. So 11 years and nine years between me and my two sisters. Right. They're like, you know, they're beautiful women. And as kids, they were the popular kids. So I was like, any bit of cool I had in me growing up was because of my sisters. But they were cool, you know. They listened to rock and roll. My sister was obsessed with Pink Floyd, which isn't necessarily rock and roll, but it was fucking close back then. I was like, oh my God, Like this is amazing. And my other sister got me into things like Genesis and The Police and Guns N' Roses and Def Leppard. And I remember my first record I bought was with my sister, which was Hysteria, which I've still got that record. Where'd you get it from? Do you remember? I do. Remember, uh, fucking, what was it called? Shit, what's that? It was National, what, something one, before HMV. What was it called? Our Price. Our Price. Not one. I know it was an O and it had three letters. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, our price. Yeah, I bought it from there. Vinyl or cassette? Oh, vinyl, yeah, vinyl. But shamefully, I also bought it with Set Me Free by Entrance. Polar opposites of cool. <laughs> absolute banger. <laughs> yeah, absolute banger. I think they've released it a few times since then. Left field question. Having two sisters, did that give you confidence with girls later on? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Definitely, yeah. It wants us terrifying. <laughs> Yeah, terrifying. I certainly grew up knowing to respect women, because if not, they'll fight you. But also, that's the right thing to do. My mother and my sisters are very strong women. I was brought up to be respectful and don't take women for granted like so many people do. And don't be a dick. Obviously, I've fallen on the wrong side of that many times in the past. But yeah, they definitely taught me how to um, taught me how to pull, that's for sure. I don't think I'd have been able to do it without my sister's game behind me. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Was your mum from Bolton? Yeah. Your dad from West Bengal in India? Yeah. My mother's white, English, from Bolton. My dad's West Bengali. So yeah, from India. And uh, again, you know, we're talking about what, like our rich upbringing of being able to aspire to be in these amazing places that we don't see on TV. Like Back then, like my dad came to England in 1966. He still upholds that um, England won the World Cup because he came here. <laughs> he still thinks that. Legend. I met my mother at university in Bolton, they both were. And then war broke out between West Bengal and East Pakistan in 1969, I think it was. So my dad finished his studies but couldn't go home because it was war torn. So there's no flights back. So I ended up staying, continued to date my mother, got married, had my sister. Then war ended. But my mum's family and my dad's family completely disowned them because the cultural differences and the fact that it was so taboo to marry outside of your colour and creed, that was only like 50 years ago. In fact, they just had their golden anniversary. That's fucking crazy. Amazingly crazy. Whereas now we take shit like that for granted. I'd like to think that the majority of people, unless you know, there's a lot of assholes in this world, but most people don't see colour and creed now. Whereas back then, you'd lose your fucking family over it. Unreal, man. Have you traced any of your family history back to India? Is it somewhere you visited? Or how has it kind of shaped you as a person? I went there like when I was a kid, obviously. But I didn't then go for years And I went in 2010 The band had been signed We'd done a few tours Probably a bit of an arsehole By all accounts Just getting drunk And getting fucked up all the time Went over to what was East Pakistan Which is now Bangladesh My family over there Are one of the biggest exporters of mangoes So we've got like Massive amounts of land Growing mangoes And we have families That look after that land and going around and meeting these families and seeing the poverty and seeing like the how fucked it is as a country because of the poverty and because of there's so much wealth there, but there's so much poverty and it's so overpopulated. You're like, this fucking, this place is never going to be right. You know, this place is never going to find a level of normality. 
And there's nothing that will bring you down to earth and make you have a, an appreciation for life and, and for how fucking lucky we are. We won the lottery of life than going to a third world country like that. When I came back from that trip, I was 100% a different person. Even my band members like massively noticed it. I remember there was a time uh, we were in band practice and me and Smev, like I said, we're like brothers. We've known each other all our lives. We had a big falling out and I, <laughs> I took my microphone off its lead and just fucking launched it. Smev, like, I wanted to fucking kill him. Luckily, he lifted his guitar just in time and it smashed into one of his pots. Fucking smashed it off, put a big dent in it. I was like, oh my God, I'm so fucking sorry. I'm so sorry. I just saw red. And then when I came back, I was just, I wasn't so highly strung anymore. I've always said this to my nephews and nieces and my, my own daughters, like you've got to go there to get an appreciation in life. Because that shit will change you, I swear to God. How long was you out there for? I went for a month. So not a massive amount of time. And I was supposed to be going this year, last year. But over there, it's so messed up with COVID still. I'm hoping to go later on this year if things level out. But most of my uncles are now passed away, sadly. So all that property over there and the everything that makes me a satire is going to disappear if I don't go over there and start kind of being a part of it. So I really want it to be a part of my life more than, than it has been. It's quite exciting, though, when you get that headspace and start to appreciate where you're from from and all the history and stuff you might feel like you're playing a little bit of catch up thinking oh shit i should have done this a while ago but i think you need to be at a certain headspace to be able to go into it properly absolutely yeah life takes over doesn't it like if it's not your day job it's the band if it's not the band it's something else if it's not that it's going out partying with all your mates and you don't want to be away from it like life takes over but i think it'd be such a missed opportunity to let like a massive part of my life just flitter away because I couldn't be asked. And now, like I say, I'm in, I'm in the headspace, I'm in the right place in my life to, to kind of go on that adventure. The biggest difficulty I think we'll have is my cousins over there, who obviously, they live in a third world country. Any money that they have, I want you to have mine as well. Like, I don't want to take anything from them. They might not be in the headspace to accept me there because they'll probably just think, oh, the big city folk, the big Westerner from the big cities over in England coming to take our money. I'm like, no, you keep it all, man. I don't want anything. Oh, man. What did you see yourself doing when you were at school? Have one fucking wild guess. Just be a rock star. That's all I ever wanted. All I ever wanted. From my first waking moment as a human being, I only wanted to be on stage. Inspired by what? Who did you see that made you think, that's fucking cool? It, well, it wasn't what I saw. It's what I'd heard. It was those records that my sisters gave me. It was that first Def Leppard record I bought. It's, you know, it's, it was the feeling, the feeling of freedom of hearing that music. And, you know, like, I'm not playing a little violin here, but I grew up in Rosendale. I was the only brown person I knew. And there was a sense of bullying and racism when I when I grew up. And music was a massive escapism for me, like huge escapism. And it wasn't something you could see. It was something you heard and felt. And if you could see that, another sense towards that would be like, fucking hell, this euphoria. It's like the perfect combination of uh, life, isn't it? So, yeah, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to make music. I wanted to wail. You say you went to school with Smed. Was that the two of you, like, against the world? Did you have a discussion, say, let's form a band or something like that? Uh, yes, it was always me and Smed against the world. And, and whenever I got into a fight, Smev always got on his back heels and ran away. But <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Mickey. <laughs> Great at starting. I'm terrible at finishing. <laughs> but no, I mean, my parents, like I was saying before, my parents recently sold our family home from growing up. Like they lived there for 35 years. And on the wall in the garage where we used to do band practice when we were like 11 years old, younger, 10 years old, we'd started a band called Death Maiden because I love Death Leopard and he loved Iron Maiden. <laughs> I swear it's like it's about this big. It's an um I, I must have got some black paint from somewhere and I drew a picture of death, like the Grim Reaper, and Death Maiden above it. It's like our first ever band logo, and it's still there now. <laughs> you need to do some t-shirts like that. You missed a trick on the Dear Superstar match. Oh no. When my parents moved out, I took a photograph of it. I'll send it to you. Shameful, but uh, also amazing at the same time. Your career is kind of crossed between music and acting. Were these two medias something that always interested you as a kid? Obviously music was, but what about film? Obviously you're surrounded by film posters now and gone into that. Was film and escapism as well? Yeah, definitely. I've always been a massive cinephile. Always loved movies. I've always, I've always been a bit obsessed. Like, you'll get this uh, with music. The worst thing that ever happened to me with music was becoming a musician because I analyse every song and I've ruined every song to myself forevermore I find it hard to enjoy music anymore because I'm just analysing the shit out of it like, I never realised that would happen it's the same thing about touring with you know, the bands that you idolise I can't go and watch bands anymore without dissecting it listening to the sonics of the mix it's infuriating it's one of the biggest curses of having success in something like music because you start analysing everything same with the film from an early age watching things like Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade I used to look out for um, like goofs so there's a bit where, do you know where uh, Sean Connery and Harrison Ford are in that room and it's all burning around them? And he tries to burn his ropes around his hands, doesn't he? And he throws the lighter on the floor, but it's still a light. 
So in one scene, it shows it one way, and then Harrison Ford's got blowing it to try and put it out, and then the camera goes back on it, it's flipped, and it's the other way. Oh, man. So I used to always look out for these things. Like Same with Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's a, a 9-11 in that, and one minute it's crashed on one side, and the next minute it's crashed on the other side. Yes. So you used to always dissect films. It's like been trashed, and the, it puts it back onto its normal yeah, thing, like all the dents have gone or something. Yeah, exactly, yeah. A shit like that I used to uh, always look out for. And um, when we stopped touring in 2012, when we decided to take a bit of a hiatus, 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 I never know how to say that word. Yeah. So when we took a bit of time off, I was like, this is my moment. This is my chance to kind of have a crack at this. So I started taking acting classes more to get into the directing way and film production. So I went to acting classes to kind of learn the trade. Strong believer in don't do something until you figured it out. And then I got a bit of a love for acting. And I thought, well, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing anything else. I may as well see if I can get an agent because no one's going to hire me as a director. That's for sure. And I was really lucky. I mean, I think it's probably quite easy because there's not many guys my age with tattoos and I'm mixed race. So, you know, I kind of tick quite a few boxes all at once. Yeah. It's that weird thing, isn't it? Finding your little niche. Yeah, exactly. I just did an audition this week playing a, a guy from Mauritius. And then I had one a few weeks ago as a Mexican, Italian, and my features and colouring are quite diverse. So it was quite easy for me to get an agent. And I got quite a good one. So and that was quite really lucky. So I got thrown in the deep end quite quickly. I forgot the question. Where were we going with this? <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about your love of films. Oh, and yeah, music. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We kind of jumped forward about 15 years. Yeah, I think that's what happened. So let's rewind it just a little bit yeah, let's rewind. before we get to the acting thing. <laughs> Oh, sorry, man. I'm shit at this. <laughs> when you started getting into the bands and stuff, was there anything that kind of like really encouraged you? What experience had you had as being a front man and a singer? Is that the role you always wanted? No. The band with Adam, we didn't have a singer. We were just two guitarists. Puff, thrashing out who can be the lead guitarist quickest. Didn't make anything even remotely audible. It's just white noise. And then we started a band when we got to college called Concrete Penguin. Fucking terrible name. <laughs> Where did that come from? Concrete Penguin. I don't know. I must have been smoking some weird, weird... Weird, weird stuff at that point in my life. It was shit, but I was the rhythm guitarist. Adam beat me, and he was the lead guitarist. And a friend of mine who sadly just passed away recently called Dylan. He was into football massively, and you know we, did, we were kids, and he did, went to come into band practice and stuff. So it was just lead guitarist and singer and bass player. So I couldn't hold a note. I didn't know how to sing. I didn't know how to be on on stage. I didn't know fuck all. But I just thought, well, someone needs to do it. I'll do it. I'm the most confident out of the four of us. I'll do it. And that's it. That was my. That was my in to being a singer. We used to play this jam session in, in Rosendale, a place called the Rhythm Station, every Sunday. And we used to go down every Sunday, me and Adam, and we just play whatever. And I've got some of the videos from back those days. Fucking hell, I was bad. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> no, they didn't kick me off stage immediately. They must have had the patience of a state. Or they might, maybe they thought they were going to be part of a hate crime or something. Can't kick this guy off stage, he's brown. <laughs> <laughs> what year was this? Do you remember? We remember in 97. And we just played jam sessions every weekend, every weekend. And we were fucking terrible. But then you know what it's like with anything. When you start first doing your podcast, I'm sure your first one was shit. I didn't listen back to him, mate. I didn't listen back. Like with any, anything you do in life, you progressively get better. And I think we just kind of got better accidentally. You know, we, we were just doing it for the love of music. And then eventually we're like, actually, you know what? I reckon we could actually play a show. I reckon we could play in front of people. How wrong were we? We were fucking still terrible. <laughs> <laughs> So then fast forward another couple of years, it was trial by fire. It really was. Like we became good musicians purely out of the sheer will of not sucking. A bit like Bill and Ted, I suppose, but we just didn't have a time machine. Just keep going, mate. That's what I say. Same with everything. Consistency. Keep pushing through. If you're loving it, eventually it'll click. We used to always get Kerrang! interviews and the likes. And they used to always say, what advice can you give to any aspiring band? And it was always, don't fucking suck. Just be the bollocks. Before you go on stage in front of anyone, just be the bollocks because you only get one shot. And if you've shit, they'll never come and see you again. And there's a lot of truth in that. But there's also, it ain't the way we did it. It's just the way I wish we did it. Like, we did it by everyone fucking hating our guts and thinking we were shit because we were. And the way we managed to kind of hone our skills and perfect our craft was just trial and error and just fucking sheer determination. Once Dear Superstar became a reality in the mid-2000s, how was they accepted onto the local scene in Manchester? Was it too different for what was happening? Did you feel the need to branch out and go nationwide? You know what? It really was. It was weird because we weren't really that different. We were just trying to uh, relive the spark of that Sunset Strip 80s vibe, like the Motley Crews and the Rats and the Warrants. We just wanted to do that. We wanted to recreate a resurgence of that life 
And we kind of did it in, in many ways in that, like, we were doing it. And then all of a sudden, loads of people were doing it. And it ain't because we were doing it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not got delusions of grandeur. We were just really lucky that whilst we had that belief in that we have all these different bands, even like the darkness coming out at the time, who were doing that same thing. We're like, oh my God, what we want to do, this is it. This is our fucking chance. Like, let's get fucking good at it. But it was so different because playing in Manchester, it was just, they wanted indie bands. And we turned up with like spandex and fucking bandanas on and sleeveless t shirts and leopard print scarves. And they're like, what the fuck? And obviously, you know what it's like when you first start a band? You'll play anyway, won't you? The lineup was all indie bands. And then us, the people are like, what the fuck is this? Was it full on glam when you first started? or Because you really kind of honed it into, you had modern sound. Yeah, we had to. It was full blown glam when we first started. Full blown glam. It changed when we got that first Papa Roach tour, I think, because the tour before Papa Roach was Michael Munro, which was full blown glam. And a bunch of tours that we did were in Finland were with glam and resurgent bands. So we got fully swept away in that world and we're like, oh my God, this is it. This is LA. This is 1984, Los Angeles. We used to print out flyers and everything. Oh God, honestly, we really felt like we were part of that, that lifestyle and that world. It wasn't until we got signed and the record label were like, guys, you have to calm this shit down because you look ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> That's great that they saw something in you, but it just needs moulding just a little bit. Yeah, because the music was going more hard rock, metally, less glam, but we were going more glam. And there was a massive disconnect between the two. Like we did not look like we sounded. And we had a song called Falling Apart off our first album. And it was like a full blown emo fucking Black Rose Fest. It was fucking terrible when you listen. Well, the song's great, but it was nothing like the people who were playing it whatsoever. There's a massive disconnect. And I think, thank God, our label kind of pulled us up on it. And then when we got the Papa Roach tour, like I said, that, that really changed it because we we were standing toe-to-toe with our one of my growing up biggest I idolised Papa Roach. Loved them. And we're like, we got to fit in here, otherwise we're just going to get fucked off straight away. And that's what kind of did it. Because you like, really hit the underground scene hard and quickly became like a, a force to be reckoned with. In 2009, you had like a relentless touring schedule with, was that the year did Book Cherry, Papa Roach, played Donington? How did that change you all as people? And did you become closer? Was it stressful or was you just all tunnel vision? Definitely tunnel vision. Yeah. We definitely brought us all closer. I mean, we were fucking closer than brothers. You know, we were away for six months at a time living in a transit van or an Iveco van because we upgraded at one point <laughs> to an Iveco. Touring around Europe, you know, doing 800 miles between shows sometimes. And it really it did massively bring us close, but it changed us not just as musicians, but as people as well. Like we were having to stand toe to toe with the biggest bands in the world, playing in front of sometimes hundreds of thousands of people. You can't suck at that. And you've got to get good and you've got to get good really fucking quick. And we realized after that first tour with Papa Roach, which going back, back to the underground thing. So we were getting a good name like in the underground scene as like, Killing it on stage, good tunes, we just got signed, good merch, all that kind of bullshit. And Dan DeVita, who was our agent and Papa Roach's agent, I've been pestering him to give us a Papa Roach tour. And he contacted Jim Morewood, an agent from Finland, but he's uh, he does all the UK territories. Quite close with him and he me messaged Jim Morewood just to say, um, this band fucking Dio Superstar will not leave me alone. Shall I give him a chance? He's like, every ticket they say they're worth, everything they say they're worth on stage, he's telling the truth, give it to him. So thank you, Jim Morewood. It was down to DeVita taking a chance and Jim Morewood backing us up that got us that tour. When when we turned up, we were still that kind of hybrid glam rock, bit of screamo, didn't really know what our identity was. And we very quickly found our feet on those tours. And then Papa Roach were amazing because we did that UK tour. And at the end of it, the fourth show that they had on that tour was Download Festival. And they were like, dude, are you going to play Download? And I'm like, no, we ain't got a slot. As you fucking do now, I'll sort it out. And Jacoby spoke to DeVita and said, get these guys on Download. And sure enough, we played Download. And then after that, they were like, do you want to come to Europe with us? And I'm like, yes, yes, we do. Yes, we do want to come to Europe with you, Jacoby. We're coming. So we went to Europe with them. And then day three of that, we're in Copenhagen and fucking Tommy Lee comes backstage. And Tommy's like, dude, you got to come to fucking Grass Pop. You got to play. I'm like, uh, I don't think we got So you fucking do now. I'm like, ah, you know, what the fuck is happening to us? It was mental. It was fucking mental. That's like fairy tale stuff, though, isn't it? That people are just pulling strings for you and making it happen because they like you. Yeah, because we just weren't dickheads. I mean, we were dickheads, but in a nice way. Dickheads in the nicest possible way. Yeah. <laughs> this is the type of dickheads we were. So we just got the Papa Roach tour, the biggest tour of our career so far. And we we're like, we got to make a good impression. So the first show was in Manchester Academy, our hometown. Before the show, we went to a, like a local sex shop and bought about 30 gay porn mags. And then when they went on stage, we broke into their dressing room and plastered every single wall in gay porn. And we thought, this is either going to make us or break us, or either going to hate us or going to kick us off the tour, but fuck it, it's worth it. They fucking loved it. 
And that's the guy, like, we weren't dickheads. Like, who the fuck does that? Who the fuck does that? Your first tour in one of the biggest bands in the world. It's supposed to be, like, really behaving yourselves. Yes, sir. Staying out of the way. Yeah. Doing what you're told. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was so much stupid shit we did that could have backfired. But luckily, we were on the right side of being an arsehole, I think. Harmless, stupid shit. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So all this madness happens. Things are going crazy. But then you go on a hiatus and you decide to go down this acting path, which we discussed, touched on a little bit earlier on. Yeah. Did you go to the USA at some point to I did. learn some stuff or did some opportunities arise over there? Yeah. So Devita, who I talked about before, our agent in the band, we still really close, you know, considering one of my best friends. He invited me to go over to LA, to spend some time with him. First time ever over there? Yeah, yeah. First time. It was like 2014, I think. So I went over to spend some time with him, but he was working and stuff. So, you know, Devita doesn't drink, so... I'd go on nights out on my own and go out during the day on my own and meet people. I was out one night in Soho House on Sunset and booked this guy called Dominic, English guy. Turns out he was from Star Trek. So Dominic was like, oh, next time you come over, you have to stay with me. We got really close. And then I went out three months later and stayed with him. And I kind of got embroiled in this acting world. And then I got recommended to go to this acting coach called Ivana Chubbuck, who like taught Brad Pitt and all the big artists. He was like, just go down, just go, go meet her. So I went and met her. I was like, I think I want to come to some of your classes. So that's all right. She was like, yeah, yeah, come down. So I did like a week of classes with her. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm going to be an actor in LA. I'm going to be an actor in LA. How did you feel over there? Did you feel comfortable over there? Yeah, totally comfortable. I was a bit worried about it because like, it's a bit weird, isn't it? It's like a dude out on his own. He's going to bars and shit. It's like lone drinker. Is he wearing a backpack? <laughs> kind of situation. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... But no, everyone was so lovely and so accepting. And I kind of, I got really into the acting world over there. Davita set me up meeting with agents over there. And the reason why it kind of fell apart, not that it fell apart, was I needed to be there. So the agent that Davita put me in touch with, she was fucking lovely. And she was like, I can absolutely represent you. I can get your auditions, but I need to be calling you at two o'clock in the afternoon to audition at five o'clock in the afternoon in the Hollywood Hills. And you need to fucking be there. I was like, well, I, I live in Manchester. She's like, no, you need to live here. So, well, what if I come out for three months a year? She's like, no, 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 no. I don't well, you need to live here. You move here, sort your shit out, and I'll represent you. So, so at that point, obviously, my daughter, I thought, well, I'll go back to the UK. I'll, I'll nail it there until it's time to go back over. And that kind of brings me where we are now. You got a little taste of it, though. Got a little mm, taste. Yeah. I did few auditions over there. I know I keep saying things about it being brown, but it's so fucking hilarious over there. So I got an audition to be in this commercial and I sat in this room with a load of guys. There's no nice way to say this. A room of African-Americans and then me. And I was like, looking at I was like, I don't think I'm the guy they want. It's just like, he's a bit tan. Get him in. Get him in. Like, it was like a proper kind of gangstery kind of like part. And I was like, oh, I can't even fucking do like a gangstery accent. I'm just going to like, oh, um, I'm going to pop a cap in your ass, asshole. It was so fucking bad. It was so fucking bad. So I thought, yeah, at that point, I need to crack it in the UK and work on my American accent. <laughs> oh, I love it, man. So you come back to the UK, dear superstar, have a bit of a resurgence. Yeah, so the reason for that was we played Manchester Academy again as a headline act exactly seven years after our last time we played it to the day. So I spoke to Smev and the rest of the band. And I was like, do we want to do this again? Should we go for it? Was you all just kind of burnt? Yeah, totally. We weren't just burnt out. We all fucked our lives up massively for that band. Right. For it not to really equate. I mean, fucking, we did more than most bands, didn't we? You know, we, we had a good fucking run of it, you know, and I will hold those memories until the day I die. I'm really fucking proud of them. But we didn't turn it into money. Just everything you sacrificed. Yeah, you know, everything cost so much. Tour buses, crew, merchandise people, the record label, management, everything took money. And we ended up with nothing. I've been toured professionally for the best part of 10 years. And we came back home and with a realisation that we're no longer in that bubble and reality strikes and we're skin and we're homeless, effectively. So we were really dubious and really sheepish about going back there because we didn't want to fuck our lives up. You know, the past seven years, we all had careers again. We all had money again. We all had houses. Getting back on your feet. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to be telling people to sell the cars again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that would be really bad to do that. <laughs> back then, it didn't matter because we were young and fucking foolish, whereas now we're, we're actually grown-ups. Yeah, so we're a bit worried about it. So we, we did that one show at Manchester Academy, did really well, sold a bunch of tickets, and it was like, oh my God, that was really good. Should we do some more of it? And then the request started coming in. So like Seven contacted us about doing Hard Rock Hell, and David was like, are we doing this again? Are we going for it? I'm like, 
it's now or never. It's like, if we're going to do it, everything's lined up. We're rehearsed. The songs are back on track. We've got some new tunes, we've got some music videos. If we're going to do it, now's the time. And we all just kind of decided not to, purely because of the fear of, that we'd repeat history, I think. Like, we burnt out in so many ways. And my heart can't take it again. And I don't mean emotionally. I mean, physically, my small black heart will finally give in if we do it again. It's just going like this. <laughs> Blowing out black plumes of smoke. <laughs> Do you miss it, though? Is it something you might consider going back to? Yeah, and we will. Just if offers come up, you could just do, like, these little small little... Yeah, exactly. Probably make more money than you ever did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. This year's um, 10 years since we released Heartless. Oh, man. So we were like, should we do a 10-year anniversary and we'll just play this, the album in um, in its uh, entirety? We all came to the conclusion of, yes, we will do it, but we don't have a bass player now. Like, Ben lives in Ibiza. There we go. You took the hint! <laughs> <laughs> that thing's gathering dust I know, there you go I'll send you the set list Can you learn it by October? Yeah, so we just don't have a bass player So we're like, well We'll see what's going on And you know Davey from Gone with the Kill? Yeah, yeah Yeah, Davey's a good friend And I'm, I'm doing a music video for him actually Soon for Warriors Great Tune And he was like, dude, I'll do it I'll be your bass player it's Like, cool, alright Yeah, well, let's do it then Let's do that And then we've not done anything since So We've basically got till between now and October to plan a show, rehearse, get our set back up to scratch, maybe write another song and then perform on stage and maybe sell some tickets. So we'll see. I don't know. Everyone's kind of up for it, but we're all doing that classic thing that all bands do. It's like, if I don't say anything and the other guy don't say anything, we'll get away. We're not doing this. But the minute one of us says, come on then, let's fucking do it. And then we'll just do it. But we're all hoping that no one says anything. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> everyone thinks the same everyone thinks the same yeah they really do mate so <laughs> what can you tell us about king's habit films which you formed to create you do like music videos films acting show reels all kinds of stuff was that something happened by accident or something you've been planning in the back of your mind they're both really so the acting thing was obviously i've got that netflix film and a few other things that i did and i was getting really into because i plan it all from the start was to kind of get to direct and production i didn't want to really be an actor so I wrote this script called Gentleman's Club. I thought it was good. In reality, it's probably not very, but I was quite proud of it. And so I put together a crew of sound engineer, cameraman, lighting engineer. And I thought, fuck it, I'll just cast it and I'll just film it. And that was a film that I got screened at Home Cinema in Manchester, which despite all the music stuff was one of my proudest moments. You know, seeing, you, seeing something that you've actually created on a big screen was brilliant. And I did that, again, out of blind ambition. I did, I've never directed before. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just leaning on other people's experience and just trying to create the vision that I had when I wrote the script. So it's a short film, it's like 15 minute short film. It's all right, it's a bit shit, but it's kind of it's kind of all right. It's where it started. But I loved it so much. I was like, I want more of that. I really loved it. And I loved directing actors as well. I feel like, you know, having done some acting, I felt like how not to be an arsehole. Having been around crew, like our tour manager, I used to treat my like shit looking back, but now I know how to not be a fucking arsehole and how to treat people nicely in a creative environment. I really enjoyed it. I feel like I got the best out of some people when I was directing. So I really want to do it again. So I wrote Dollar Mason, which was all about a failed drug addict musician, rock star. Basically, it was based on myself. I've got to say, life imitating art, art imitating life was the things you drew on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously the storyline is nothing what happened in my actual life, but the seed was there so i wrote that but i didn't want to make the same mistakes i did on the previous film so i started doing these sketches i thought well if i'm gonna upload them i need a film i need a name king's habit that works we all know what the king's habit is i'm assuming <laughs> all right well you're an innocent man and i like that about you <laughs> i'll let everyone else work that out for themselves all right so I've created this again out of blind ambition and nothing more than just an idea. Started doing some sketches and like little shorts and show reels for people. And then Dear Superstar did this thing in 2019. I was like, well, let's do a music video. So then I shot a couple of music videos for the band. I was like, actually, you know what? They're fucking really good. I reckon I can do that for other people. So I'm going to start doing more music videos. Then I shot Dollar Mason. And then that kind of brings us to today where I've gone fallen back into because of Coronation Street into um, into acting again. So I've got this new mini series which has fallen on my lap by this amazing writer. He's written this amazing script, really fucking amazing, like Channel 4 worthy. Feels a bit like uh, people just do nothing, but for Northerners all around a taxi firm. I love it. I love the scripts. I've got actors for every role that I've got in mind and that's the next thing I'm going to do. Wonderful. And that's why King's Habit exists. Excellent, man. So you just mentioned it there. 2022 has seen you make your debut on the iconic TV show Coronation Street. Is, is it Rahul Paswan? Yeah, Rahul Paswan. 
how it came about was about two years ago, I got an audition to play a guy called Imran on Coronet Street, who's still in the show now. And it was a three-year kind of regular part and hundreds of people have auditioned to it. And I got down to the last two, screen tested on set with the actors and the directors. As I was walking out into this awful, Charlie DeMello, who plays Imran, I'm sorry about what I'm about to say. If you ever hear this, hopefully not. I did the screen test, I was like, fucking nailed that. Fucking nailed that. Walked out and I saw Charlie, who ultimately got the part. I looked at him and was like... <laughs> Fucking got this. Good luck, mate. See you later. I was that confident. Yeah. I just thought, fucking, I look way better than you. I'm definitely getting this. That up my own ass. <laughs> that confident. <laughs> so I was convinced. And then a friend of mine who works on Coronation Street rang me and said, apparently, I've, I've heard you've got it. Congratulations. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm going to be on Coronation Street for three years. I didn't really plan for this. I never wanted to be on Coronation Street for three years. Anyway, I then got a call about a week later from my agent saying, oh, they've gone with Charlie. I'm like, what? You're fucking joking, aren't you? So I didn't get the part. So then over the past like 18 months, I've had 12, maybe more auditions for Coronation Street, lots of different parts and never got it. And then I got the part for the social worker and my missus, well, she was a social worker. So when the part came through, she was like, don't do this with one of your acting friends. We'll workshop it together. So we did. And yeah, man, I, I got the part. And it was three episodes to start with, but with an option for more. So they've like, kind of retained the characters for 12 months. They can call me back whenever. I'm just waiting for more episodes now. Superb. How is it stepping onto such a legendary ground? But it's also like, I mean, it's not far from your hometown as well. That's kind of cool. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's a perfect job, really. You know, as an actor, usually you're in Vancouver or Los Angeles or down in London for however long, like, be the perfect job. It was actually pretty good. So Jimmy Harkishan, who plays Dev, is a friend of mine and great guy, a lot of fun. And Sam Aston, who plays Chesney, drinks in my local. I know Jimmy really well. I know Chesney quite well, as in him in the pub and saying hello well. He ain't my lover. I'm not giving him a reach around. <laughs> so my first scene is with Jimmy and Sam. So I, I walk on set and I'm like, it. like you know what um, Deb's like from Coronation Street. He's like, like I'm Mickey, man. What are you doing here? So good to see you. Come here. Give me a hug, man. <laughs> and the director was like, who the fuck's this guy? Like, why the fuck does he know everyone? What the fuck's going on? So yeah, the first day was kind of like I'd always been there and everyone's so accommodating and it was really good. It was really good. And then the following couple of days I was there, it was just more of the same. And Dolly, who plays Gemma, Chesney's wife and Sam, keeping in touch with them now on and off, going meeting for a drink and stuff. So yeah, it's good. Really good people there. I tell you what, every single one of those actors on that street are fucking world-class. To be able to learn scripts that fast and deliver them that well with... No retakes, five cameras shoot all at once. There's no like, oh, let's do that one more time. You just fucking shoot it and you go on to the next scene. It's so fast moving. It's such a well oiled machine. It takes a special actor to be able to keep up with that. Not that I'm one of those. I just fuck it up for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's your job. Get in and cause some chaos around everybody. Yeah, well, that was my job as a lead singer. I don't think it fucking washes being an actor. You're obviously an incredibly passionate and creative person. Are there any projects that you can talk about which you'd love to see get off the ground and become a reality? So. I don't give a fuck if I, because it's not going to come off anyway, but I had an amazing audition two weeks ago, so I'm still waiting to hear back, for the lead in the new series of Quantum Leap. What? <laughs> wow. What can you divulge on this? Not a lot, really. So, so basically, Sam Beckett is still Quantum Leaping, and they're looking for a guy called Ben, and that's, that's out of the domain anyway. So Ben's going to be the new guy who jumps into the Quantum Leap accelerator. And Al is now a woman. I don't think I can tell you her name. And it's not a reboot. It's a soft reboot. So it's based on the same universe. So Ben is a Indian descent guy, scientist, super intelligent, who jumps in the Quantum Leap accelerator and starts leaping. Wow. And goes through the same trials and tribulations as Sam Beckett. But in my audition piece, Sam Beckett is mentioned. So I'm like, Scott Bakula, me and Scott are going to be mates. We're going to be fucking best mates. I can feel it now. Was that one of your favorite TV shows growing up? Dude, I fucking loved Quantum Leap. Did you know it was Quantum Leap going in or was it like, oh, it's this secret project? I was skiing in Italy. Oh, I was skiing in Italy uh, when the audition came in. And then my agent was like, can you get this um, over to us um, by Sunday? And it was like Friday night when I got it. And there was 11 pages of dialogue and I was on the piss skiing in the Alps. 
And it kept coming to like the head in his quantum leap, confidential, blah, 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 all that kind of shit. So I went back to my agent. I was like, listen, I really want to do this, obviously, but I'm pissed. I'm going to be pissed for the next two days. I get back on Monday. Then I need to learn it. Is there any chance you can ask for an extension? Thinking they're just going to tell us to fuck off. And in which case, I'll just get my mates to film it in the hotel room and I'll just do it pissed. But at least I've done it. So then she came back to me about 12 hours later. She's like, I've spoken to them. And uh, yes, they've agreed to give you an extension until Wednesday. So I'm like, okay, if they're giving me an extension, that's a fucking good sign. Because if I was a Hollywood, casting director and some scrubber from Manchester just said can you give me an extension I just tell him to fuck right off I don't think so, mate. Who the fuck do you think you are? This is you, like, walking that fine line, like, when you did, like, the gay porn on the Papa Roach dressing rooms. It's like, can I get away with this? Can I get away with it? Yeah, maybe. Probably would have put gay porn on Scott Bakula's dressing room day one. I'd probably wait until day three. <laughs> and it'd be midgets, amputee, scat porn. <laughs> oh, man. Well, mate, I wish you the best of luck. You never Thanks, know. Mate. Thank you. You never know. You never know. You've got to be in it to win it. I did an audition for Guy Ritchie a while back as well. And I was like, fucking hell, that's Guy Ritchie. There's not a film that Guy Ritchie's done that I don't like, except for King Arthur, because that is a piece of shit. And <laughs> But, you know, doing auditions like that, you're like, you've got to be in it to win it, aren't you? Yes, I've not won one. Yes, I am Rahul from Coronation Street, which I didn't really anticipate in my life ever saying that sentence. But you've got to be in it to win it. And we'll see. But the next thing for me, going back to your original question, is to get that miniseries produced. I think that's the next one. Get some good actors and get it made. Wonderful, man. Wonderful. Well, I wish you nothing but success. It's been great. I say I've not seen your face for a long time, but I've been keeping up with everything you've been doing. Thanks, man. How badly have I aged? Is it bad or is it? No, you look exactly the same. Dude, thank you so much, man. It's been amazing. Learn the bass again. Get good so we can go on tour. That'd be amazing. I'm here. I'll dust it off just for you. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Thanks, bro. Mickey Satya, ladies and gentlemen, hope you had fun listening to his amazing journey through rock and roll to walk in the streets of one of the UK's most treasured TV series. Thanks so much to Mickey for sharing some time and stories with me here on the podcast, and I can't wait to see and hear what he does next. Be sure to check out all the cool content that his film company, King's Habit Films, are putting out over at kingshabitfilms.com or on their YouTube channel. And of course, keep an eye on your TV screens for hopefully more appearances on Coronation Street in the future. That is all for today episode be sure to get up to date with all older episodes which can be found at stvpod.com and check back every tuesday and friday for a brand new episode but till then look after yourselves and speak real soon <laughs>